Before we get into today's show, let me tell you about HubSpot. If you're hustling in the trenches to build a business or bootstrapping one of your own, let's talk about an AI-powered tool that can lighten up your workload a bit. HubSpot's campaign assistant is a game changer for creating marketing campaigns at scale. It quickly turns your key selling points into a cohesive pitch, which helps you deliver knockout emails, ads, and landing pages in minutes. So let campaign assistant take care of the campaigns so you can get back to growing your business. Work smarter, not harder at HubSpot.com slash campaign dash assistant. What's going on, everyone? It's Wednesday, February 23rd, and you are listening to The Hustle Daily Show. I'm Zachary Crockett, and I'm here with our daily writers, Rob Litterst and Trung Fan. What's up, Trung, man? I'm looking at your bookcase right now on video, and for anyone <laughs> listening out there, Trung behind him has a book about David Bowie. He's got a basketball, <laughs> a clock, and a Darth Vader helmet. <laughs> the uh, the Vader one's actually not supposed to be there. Uh, I, I should probably take it down. It's probably not sending the best uh, image. <laughs> Having said that, he is the protagonist of the Star Wars story, and in the end, obviously, is kind of a good guy. But love it. All I'm saying is this: Vader at the end of Jedi. That's who I am. Okay, none of none of this stuff before. <laughs> All right. Well, today's protagonist is going to be Spotify. Yes. Today, we're talking Spotify. The streaming giant has uh, dropped more than a billion dollars on acquisitions in the podcast space. We're going to take a step back and break down their master plan. We're also going to get into what happens when an AI bot tries to copyright a piece of artwork. And we're going to talk about why the IRS has a big mountain to climb this year with tax filings. But before we get into all that good stuff, let's get you caught up on the day's news. So last week, a massive cargo ship carrying 4,000 Porsches, Audis, Bentleys, Lamborghinis, and other Volkswagen Group cars caught fire off the coast of Portugal's Azores Islands. Tugboats have been dispatched to battle the blaze, but it's a little too late. The total loss has been estimated to be between $150 and $400 million dollars. Bad news for VW, but on the bright side, they're currently in talks to take Porsche public. So here's to hoping their IPO doesn't also turn into a big dumpster fire. Big news for all you Girl Scout cookie aficionados. This year, the organization released a new cookie, a caramel brownie kind of thing called Adventurefuls. Well, turns out that one of the major bakeries they contract with is facing labor shortages. So there aren't really enough cookies to go around. The adventure full supply will be capped at just 7% of overall cookie sales this year. Uh, there is some good news here, though. Cookie demand is stronger than ever, and things are looking to be much better for the Scouts than last year when 15 million boxes of cookies went unsold. Oil prices have surged up to nearly $100 a barrel, pushing the average gas price in the U.S. to $3.50 a gallon. That's the highest prices have been since 2014. The surge is largely related to mounting tension between Ukraine and Russia, which provides 12% of the world's oil. But there's also some other things going on in the background here, like the oil cartel OPEC cutting supply dramatically in 2020. And lastly, Fat Brands, the owner of illustrious chains like Fat Burger and Johnny Rockets, saw its stock tank by more than 20% yesterday after revelations that the company's CEO, Andrew Wiederhorn is under investigation for wire fraud, money laundering, and tax evasion. The company denies the charges, but this isn't Wiederhorn's first rodeo with the SEC. Back in 2004, he pled guilty to filing a fake tax return and was hit with a $2 million fine and a year in federal prison. That's going to do it for the news. Let's get into today's big story. All right, guys. So uh, it's no secret that Spotify is making uh, just an enormous push into podcasting. Three years ago, they had 185,000 podcasts. And last year, that number was up to 3.6 million. They obviously linked a huge $200 million plus deal with Joe Rogan. They've got deals with Michelle Obama, Prince Harry. They've also snatched up a bunch of podcast networks like Gimlet and Ringer. But they've also quietly kind of amassed an empire of backend tools. Right, Rob? Yeah, so the content acquisitions get a ton of the headlines, but on the back end, Spotify has been building slowly towards this kind of all encompassing podcast back end that gives podcasters everything they need to quickly and easily spin up a podcast, get discovered, and 
ultimately monetize it and be able to show advertisers exactly how well their podcast is is performing as a way to reach new customers. And so if you go back to 2019, they acquired a company called Anchor, which helps podcasters create podcasts. In 2020, they acquired Megaphone, which offers advertising technology and allows Spotify to insert these ads into podcast episodes. And in 2021, they acquired Pods, which is a discovery platform that ultimately helps podcasters get found. And just last week, they bought Chartable and Pod Sites, which are both these kind of analytics platforms that ultimately help podcasters show their advertisers how well the podcasts are performing and ultimately give them ROI on their ad placements. And kind of the lack of insights into analytics has been a big problem in podcasting in recent years, right? Rob mentioned and Zach mentioned all the different investments that are being made by Spotify. I think if we zoom back a bit and ask why they're doing this, it will help frame the future of can they be successful with ads and how important it is to them. So Spotify obviously started as a music streaming company. And even today, their biggest cost of goods is paying out royalties to the artists and the record labels. So 70 cents of every dollar goes to artists and goes to music labels. Yeah. And, and so what that does for the company is if they just kept on this trajectory, no matter how big they got, their margins would almost never improve. Right. Because they had to keep paying out 70% to artists. And this Netflix faced a very similar issue around 2012, 2013. They were licensing all their content from the major studios. And that's when House of Cards came out, right? That was their first kind of big in-house hit. Right. And now, I think over the past decade, they spent $100 billion on content that they own. And that's obviously a massive investment. And that hasn't even stopped them from the fact that, yes, they've grown into a massive business. But as we saw with their 30% stock drop early this year, basically one day, that they still have existential questions whether the model can work, even though they've gone all in on creating their own content. Right. But Spotify realizes that to build a massively scalable business, they cannot keep going on the music and song road because they just keep paying out 70 cents on a dollar. So that's where the podcasts come in, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, Rob alluded to it. The big headlines are Joe Rogan 200 mil, the Obamas for 20 plus mil, right? Prince Harry and Meghan Markle for 20 plus mil. But at the end of the day, for Spotify to really have a massively scalable podcast business, they have to allow these 3 million plus podcasters you mentioned that have been on the platform. Well, what percentage of them can actually make a living, right? Right. So the the, the ad stack they're building, I'm comically overly simplifying this. <laughs> but right now on Google, right, if you're reading a, a blog post or anything that's text-based, people are constantly buying the ad inventory up on those websites. So Spotify is trying to make the equivalent where all this audio content, which is user generated, let's take away the big names like the Rogans and the Markles of the world, but it's just people like you and me creating content and throwing it on Spotify. They're giving us a chance to monetize now with the tools, the analytics that you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. And Rob, you kind of hit the nail on the head. I was listening to Bill Simmons podcast. He's the head of the ringer. And he had done ad reads for so long on his own ads, like for over a decade now, right? Like me, undies, Squarespace. I'd heard him do all these ad reads, right? But for the first time ever recently, I was going for a run listening to Bill Simmons. And I heard a random Canadian bank inserted into his <laughs> podcast. So there's that targeting, right? Right. There's a targeting that Spotify is offering. Localized ads. A hundred percent. I don't know if it'll work, but that's what they're building towards. And just to summarize, podcast is so important for them as a business because the song model is probably not super scalable because of the margin structure. So they're going all in on podcasts, hoping that they can create that. Whether or not they can is a totally different question. But if they don't do it, they probably will not be able to win in the long run Hmm. in the audio space. Totally. So stepping back, these acquisitions give them control over the entire kind of supply chain, for lack of a better term, of podcasts. Exactly. It gives podcasters the tools to create podcasts. It gives listeners the ability to discover them. Yep. And then, of course, it has the monetization on the back end that allows podcasters and the platform to make more money. Correct. Absolutely. And what's interesting about this to me, too, is like Apple has seemed to be pretty gung ho about keeping podcasts kind of open and and not really building kind of like this entire infrastructure Mm -hmm. around it. Have you heard anything on that? I don't think Apple is really trying to go in this direction where they kind of like box everybody in and have this like ad ecosystem going. I mean, that was a criticism of Apple for probably a decade at this point. They were the ones that started. I mean, I... 
pods, right? And like uh, podcasts, right. literally the entire industry is built from the Apple nomenclature. <laughs> right. And they've had the number one podcast player up until a couple of years ago when Spotify finally just shot right by them. It's almost got to the point where it just didn't move the needle for them. It, it, mm-hmm. it was just right. the podcasting as an industry. You touched on it earlier, Zach. It's like, it's not super mature, right? It's like, a, it's a billion dollar industry in ad revenue, I believe this year. Terrestrial radio is still a 12 to $13 billion ad industry. Hmm. So like the difference is just so massive. And we're talking about Apple 10 years ago, but obviously Apple today is a $3 trillion company, but even Apple 10 years ago, called a three to $500 billion company, it just didn't move the needle for them. The pace that they're doing their content now suggests that they did realize they dropped the ball. To answer Rob's question, I don't know necessarily if Apple wants to keep it open. I mean, their history suggests that they're not about being open. <laughs> right, that's what their I was entire thinking history too, yeah. is about being a walled garden. Right. I just don't know how strategic podcasts have been for them. And even, to be honest, now how strategic it is, right? They're just such a big company. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, an analyst at Citibank recently analyzed these acquisitions and found that they weren't really bringing in that many new premium subscribers or leading to paid conversions. Right. Of course, the days are early and these are big plays. They take a very long time. You, you mentioned Netflix, which is another example. But I guess how long of a play do you think this is? And do you think this approach, this acquisition based approach is going to pan out for Spotify in the long run? I mean, just from the reading that I've done, I think it's a pretty long play for them. I think it's something that they're obviously pretty committed to. And Trung, I think you tapped on it too, is it's kind of existential for them because they can't just, they can't stick to music. Right. They have to move outside music. Mm-hmm. I know they acquired this company far away too. For audiobooks. For audiobooks, exactly. So they're moving into like all those audio spaces. Amazon already has Kindle, obviously, and Amazon's touching on podcasts. So like they're definitely going to clash at some point. And Amazon has the budget to spend whatever they want on podcasting stuff, obviously. So I think Spotify has to nail this. And it's something they're willing to go all in on. We did something back in January where we looked at the number of podcasts and the number of users. And one thing that I think is still the biggest challenge for Spotify, and I think Substack actually had this happen too when they started getting a lot of new newsletter writers, is discovery. I think it's still really, really hard for new podcasters to get discovered. And if Spotify can nail that and somehow figure out how to use pods to really get new podcasts in front of new listeners and really kind of become that pairing mechanism where you can find the perfect show for the perfect listener, then I think they'll have something super special. But that's obviously so, so hard to do. Rob, as you're saying that, it did make me realize that So one well-known growth mechanism for podcasts, which is what kind of what Joe Rogan actually did over the past decade was, you know, these short five, six minute clips from his four hour podcast. Yeah. That was like well known to be one of the best growth mechanisms because, you know, you're just on YouTube, you're minding your own business and then you get a Rogan, like Kevin Hart, three minute piece, right? Totally. Enough of those drips pull you in. The thing about Spotify, which is interesting because they do have the app, right? Mm -hmm. That real estate where people will spend 30, 40 minutes inside the app to your point, that gives the surface area to kind of potentially really help people with discovery. So you're scrolling through Spotify, maybe they'll start clipping out shorts from podcasts that they think will match with you, right? No doubt. Here's 30 seconds from, uh, I don't know, a daily business and tech newsletter you might like. <laughs> I'm not going to say the name of the company that rhymes with, well, I, we know which one we're talking about, but just as a point of reference. So discovery, very important. And that could be a game changer, which really expands the pie. Back to Zach's original question. Will it work? I don't know if it'll work. I am going to echo what Rob said. They probably didn't have a choice. Yeah. That's, that's where I stand on that. Trung, I love how when you get really excited about something, you get this like growl in your voice. <laughs> it's like the greatest thing I've ever heard. My, my wife says <laughs> it, the voice travels, which is probably a really backhanded <laughs> compliment. <laughs> I was just reading about like infrasounds, like when tigers roar, they produce like this infrasound that like penetrates your body. <laughs> when your excitement shines through, I, I, I'm Googling it vibrates that. my body. I'm Trung, Googling that. Trug's inner tiger. I love it. <laughs> All right. Well, a uh, little change of pace here. I want to move on to something uh, truly bizarre. So have you guys ever seen those, those crazy pieces of art that are like generated by AI bots? Yes, I ha- I've seen quite a few. Uh, I think I've seen these on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, they're like these weird looking like trippy images of like dogs or, you know, whatever. Well, there was just a really interesting legal case. The U.S. Copyright Office recently rejected a request to copyright a work of art created by AI. So a three person board found that an image created by an AI bot did not include an element of human authorship, and that's necessary for copyright protection under U.S. law. Fair enough. Makes sense to me. But an interesting question, like, in the future, as we rely on AI a bit more to create things, what 
the copyright laws around that are going to be. Well, would the human authorship in this case be, and, I, and I'm sure, I didn't, I didn't look into it, but I'm sure that it's being argued, is that the human authorship is in the code itself. Exactly. That allowed the AI. I, is that the argument? I believe so. So obviously, there was a guy who created the algorithm behind the AI. Right. Um, but he wasn't able to copyright, the, the bot was not able to copyright the image. And it, it kind of harkens back to this really interesting case from 2018, this was all over the internet, but a monkey stole a photographer's camera and actually took a selfie with it. And there was a big case as to whether or not the monkey could file a copyright on that photo. <laughs> and it was deemed, uh, like this case, that any form of non-human expression is ineligible for copyright protection. So that monkey was not given permission to copyright his selfie. Unbelievable. What does the monkey do for like a day <laughs> job? Like, is it in a zoo or like, what's the situation? <laughs> Well, he's certainly not going to be able to live off the royalties. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, but that, hold on. So the monkey case, well, that sounded like a bit of a, uh, you know, when people will bring a case just to make a point. Yeah. What was the context behind the monkey even wanting potentially the rights to that? And oh, was it because it does sound like a bit like performance art. That someone yeah. So, so here's what happened in that case. I think what happened is the photographer whose camera was stolen tried to use the photograph and actually, animal rights groups oh, okay. filed a suit trying to make it so that the monkey would have the rights to the oh photo instead of the photographer. So oh a little bit goodness. of perform- uh, yeah, there, there is a little, yeah, little, it was a little performative, <laughs> but still raises like some really interesting questions about where the divisions are drawn in the sand with copyright law. And also, you know, AI is going to play a big role in the future, and we're going to have potentially far in the future blends of human and AI contributions. Oh, totally. And things are going to get complicated. This reminds me a ton of that like GPT-3 thing from OpenAI mm-hmm. where people were throwing like things that G- they had basically like sent a prompt into GPT-3 and it would like type out an essay or like type out like a paragraph or whatever, and they would throw it onto Twitter. And some of it was insane. Like you could not tell that this was... <laughs> code doing this like it totally seemed like a a human writing it yeah it's a fascinating precedent though it's going to be really interesting yeah maybe something we'll we'll look back on like a thousand years from now and and cite as canon well actually (laughs) the uh the the monkey photograph case it actually does sound like it will be the precedent as is the case with this ai one right so like all jokes aside in like 50 years there's going to be like the equivalent of uh, you know the scopes trial they had that big famous trial <laughs> right. of the century. I mean, literally, right. there's going to be a right. trial of the century and like the precedent is going to be the monkey and this photograph. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I, it's, seriously, right? Totally. It's incredible. That's our protection against our robot yeah, overlords exactly. right there is, is the monkey. Oh man, it's so funny when like the, the legal precedent that's set down is like such a stupid thing. Like, it's just, <laughs> right. you know talk what? about I, meme words. I think that would actually be a funny, uh, that would be worthwhile digging into. What are like the 10 most absurd legal precedents or absurd now right like at the time it probably yeah made a lot dude of sense. it sounds like a tailor made right. uh, tweet thread yeah there you go right 100 uh, <laughs> percent. all right guys we're obviously moving into tax season here and um another thing i wanted to touch on is just the irs seems like it has a staggering uh hill to climb here it has 23.5 million returns that still need to be filed from last year and uh, rob there's kind of a catch that's preventing them from filing all this stuff right Yeah, this is absolutely mind-blowing to me. So you said it, Zach, it's 23.5 million tax returns and other documents from last year. And the big issue here for them is the IRS still transcribes paper returns line by line. So all of the paper (laughs) tax returns that they get are insanely manual. And there are a few things that this brings up for me. First of all, there are only 1,200 workers that they're reassigning Mm -hmm. to this. So those 1,200 workers, I feel so bad for them over the coming months. First of all, how do they still work there? I mean, with like the great resignation, it just seems like this would just be so brutal and there's so much opportunity out there. Wait. That's 1,200 workers for 23.5 million uh, Somebody pulled the calc. Yeah. So that's about 19,000 returns per employee. (laughs) So so hang (laughs) on In the next two months. Yeah. Uh, In the next two months. So if you did 100 a day, that's uh, called eight hours. That's 12 an hour. So if you did 100 a day. That's line by line. If you did 100 returns, that's 200 days just for your portion. 300 filings per employee per day. Um. That's ridiculous. Completely insane. I've thought of this for a long time with crypto is like crypto must make 
tax returns so confusing and like all the new challenges and kind of like weird little roadblocks that get thrown in with crypto and you throw that into this and it's just like i feel so bad for these workers like this is just it's gonna be the most brutal tax season ever and it almost makes me think that crypto is like i have a conspiracy theory here (laughs) maybe crypto's entire purpose is just to like overload the irs and just so that they're kind of make it well i mean the the, (laughs) listen i didn't want to have to get into this but we're bringing up into an h&r block (laughs) all right people i I did not want to have to go there but here we go trunk fan did a little bit of research so there's this big movement around return free filing i'm sure you guys have heard or are familiar with this if not let me tell the listeners what's going on so the government for 50 to 60 percent of the u.s population they have everything they need to send mm-hmm. you a pre-filled filing, right? Because their employer is sending you a W-2. They get the 1099s. So say uh-huh. for 50 to 60% of the population, the government can pre-fill and send you a form. This already happens in Scandinavia. Mm-hmm. So in Finland, Denmark, and Sweden, you just get from the government a form and you look at it big, oh yeah, this looks good. If not, then you can start moving into preparing your own taxes. So for years... Even going back to Reagan, Reagan was like, yeah, let's, this sounds like it makes sense. Let's reduce the amount of time people have to spend on tax filings. Cause the average American spends 13 hours a year and $200 on tax filings. Wow. Oh my God. Yeah, it's wild. So you can guess who has been lobbying against the return free filing movement. (laughs) It is Intuit and HR Block. They spend millions Mm -hmm. of dollars a year. ProPublica did a massive investigation into this a couple years ago. This is their argument. All right. I'm not going to pass judgment here. So this is Intuit's argument for why they believe that tax prep software should continue to be a mainstay and that the return free filing is not necessarily the right road. They say that if the average American doesn't take the time to prepare their own taxes, it takes the financial discipline out of their own lives because they're not really investigating what their day-to-day finances are, what the annual finances Mm -hmm. are, what their budgeting is. Okay. That sounds like it has a modicum of truth. Uh-huh. I don't fully buy, but no. there, there's the, that's a good <laughs> argument. Here's what H&R Block says. This is what the H&R Block spokesperson says. The average American, if they rely on the government in a return free filing world to just send them pre-filled tax forms, they may not get all the deductions that you could typically get if you were going line by line because the government won't know as much as individual. That actually sounds a bit more plausible. But that all goes back to why are taxes so complicated? They're so complicated. Right. So that's my rant. I would love to for you guys to think about so that. So good. I didn't know so, any of that. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's fascinating. Man, like anything that makes taxes easier, I'm totally down for. And yeah, I get that argument that it disconnects people from their actual finances, but Come on. There are other ways to get in touch with your finances. Taxes is just one part of it. Nobody actually wants to do them. Exactly. Just make it easy. Zach, I would love your opinion on this. I know that uh, corporate lobbyist boils your blood. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Into it. (laughs) That's my thoughts. Yeah, this is the saga has been going on for a long time. You know, other countries have auto filing set up. I I know there's been a a big push for it over the years. And yeah, unfortunately, lobbyists hold a lot of sway in in America. And I I don't know if I fully buy the arguments that Intuit and um, H&R Block lay out there, but... There's a grain. There's a grain of truth to it. Like, it's just a tiny... If you look closely enough, you can like nod your head and be like, oh, yeah, oh, okay. Let me add this. So to in their defense, this is what they have come up with. So they have agreed to some sort of free filing, which they do offer... Having said that, Intuit is also very well known for the dark arts of pushing you into the premium options in tax filing. They're oh, very good at UX flows. <laughs> like, I'll tell you oh this right God. now, right? Oh, yeah. They, they got me. That 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 free filing until the last 30 seconds, and then they hit you with that $89.99. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've almost accidentally clicked on like the premium, premium version like every single year for the last decade. It's ridiculous. Yeah. They're Yeah, they're geniuses. Oh, man. All right, last thing we want to touch on here, the NFT trading platform OpenSea, they're in some deep water right now. <laughs> there was a crazy phishing scam last week, I think, that resulted in $3 million in lost tokens. Nice. I, I guess some hacker who has yet to be identified stole 254 tokens. He basically sent out a malicious email asking people to transfer their assets to a new contract. 17 people fell for it, and uh, a lot of people are missing their their apes right now and other digital stuff or whatever they had in yeah. their wallets. 
Full disclosure, I own an NFT on OpenSea and I got this email over the weekend. At least I think it was this email because it says exactly what I read that this email said. Hmm. It's all about some like new gas free contract. And I came so close to clicking on it. Like, honestly, if it wasn't the weekend, I probably would have done it. But luckily, I was just lazy on the weekend and didn't want to do anything and just waited. And then the news came out. So what you're saying. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, that's exactly that's the number one takeaway. Yes, exactly. (laughs) This definitely to me, like the big takeaway is like nobody has any idea what's going on with crypto security and like the technology is just so new. My takeaway is two parts, right? Is like uh, uh-huh. OpenSea has had to deal with other very uh, security issues related with their platform, like specifically how they manage contracts and their website. This one to me is just a pure phishing issue. Right. It was catalyzed by the fact that they did a migration, right? But a software companies make changes all the time. OpenSea actually is involved right now with a, a lawsuit around a board ape that was stolen. So that, that one's very much more specific to issues that they have to deal with. But the phishing side is like, look, I'm not saying I'm beyond getting fished because uh, I scroll so quickly and just like nod and assume things are <laughs> correct. But uh, there's one rule. I will never open up a PDF from a random website. I know that. That's it. That's the only Ever. one rule I know. Phishing is just the law of large numbers, right? You send around enough and um, obviously OpenSea becomes a target because they know how much money is on there. My dad got hit by a phishing email for a Canadian hmm. bank, right? Like they're quite sophisticated because these phishing uh, attacks will send you to fully cloned websites that look exactly the same as the real deal, right? So that was when I read it. I'm like, oh, this looks like a good old fashioned phishing attack. OBC does have other problems to deal with regarding their platform. But uh, this one to yeah. me was uh, much more clearly a phishing. I like that no PDF rule, Trung. I'm going to live by that from <laughs> now on. <laughs> yeah. And obviously, you know, this particular phishing scam led to a 70% reduction in trading on OpenSea. Yeah. A big takeaway for me here is just how crazy of an impact something like this still has on, you know, the NFT market. Like one phishing scam that affected 17 people right. drives down trading 70% on the platform. Yeah, you lose, con- and that's the thing, right? So the CEO of uh, OpenSea did put out like a Twitter thread addressing this. And uh, as much as they tried to emphasize that this was a phishing attack, I think the main point, Zach, is like, you know, it's a confidence business, right? Is mm-hmm. you lose confidence in a platform where you're securing assets, especially sure. digital assets of this value. You, you can go kaput quickly. And right. what that actually means functionally for them is, is there something in the onboarding of new users that basically is like, they're, they're going to have to have a window. You know, when you have like an onboarding, there's like six windows. Step four mm-hmm. is like, here are eight things we will never, ever send to you. Memorize this, sear it into your brains. We will never send you these eight things. It's like that, but that would right. be the type of like thing they would have to implement to stave off a future attack of this nature. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not an apples to apples comparison, but like, you know, it kind of harkens back to the early days of like the gig economy. Like, you know, when, when Uber and Lyft are launching, obviously, you know, the whole gig economy is built on trust. You have to trust strangers to come into your home to hang a painting or to give you a ride to the airport or something. And when a report comes out that, you know, an Uber driver murdered someone, it's going to set right. things back significantly. Right. That was a very steep hill to climb for gig economy companies. That, no, you're right. Web3, it might be even tougher just because everything's digitized and it's not human to human interfacing directly, like in person. It's a little more nebulous and you have to trust kind of wires over the internet, so to speak. Um, Moxie, Marlon Spike, the, the founder of Signal, the uh, messaging app, he had that really famous article because he's a cryptography legend. He's a super well-respected in the cryptography space. He wrote the entire article where he had tried to create an NFT. He created a DAO. So he was seeing what the guts of Web3 today look like. And, you know, one of the takeaways he had, which was, the, I think his main takeaway was, you know, a lot of people don't want the full decentralization, right? They don't want to run nodes on their phone. So if I were to have a big macro takeaway, it's, Crypto to get full mainstream adoption because the benefits of cryptography, the benefits of decentralization, there are many. But if you can't crack the UX problem, the user interface problem, Mm -hmm. even today, I 
as an, a pretty quote unquote savvy internet user, still can't make my way around a lot of the <laughs> Web2 technology, right? Right. And like, I get a call every day from my dad or my mom, like, hey, reset my password for me. So like that generation hasn't even figured right. out Web 1.5. So how are they going to go all the way to Web 3? So these are really like, it is a UX user behavior problem. And sure. there, there is no easy crack. And something I have mentioned in the past, I mean, there is one like, I wouldn't call it a silver bullet, but one company that actually has the distribution and capability to really mainstream crypto is Apple. Because you're carrying potentially a fully encrypted hardware wallet in your pocket every single day. And there are methods, it won't be easy and it will require many like cross company, cross industry cooperations on setting standards, but you could conceivably make an iPhone, which there are more than a billion in the world right now. You can make that a crypto wallet. Tim Cook himself mm -hmm. has said he has invested in Bitcoin and Ethereum. It's not a huge part of his portfolio, but he says he believes in the tenets of it. And Apple's position on privacy over the past decade has been very clear. So if there was one company where I think, I mean, it's the biggest company in the world, could yeah. make a significant difference in making crypto easy to use, it is Apple. I don't know if it'll happen, but just to sure, kind of sure. address your question of is there a larger macro takeaway is like they need to fix UX. Yeah. And I don't yeah, know how yeah. that's going to happen. Yeah. You hit on that perfectly, Trung. It's like the entire pitch, like the sale, the sales pitch of crypto is that it's decentralized and it's going to move past these centralized platforms. But it's that same decentralization that's making it really hard for people to actually use it and get on board. So it's like this kind of inherent paradox to, to crypto, I feel like. The nature of technology is to decentralize and centralize. If, if, if you look mm -hmm. through the history of technology since Intel was founded, it, it is pretty consistent. Take television as an example, right? Television, you had the three networks and then cable came in and created hundreds of different channels for people. And then now it's re-centralizing again into the big tech platforms. It's the nature of technology is to kind of go through these cycles. The problem is, but at the end of the day, you have to think about the psychology of the human, which is what Moxie, the founder of Signal, really emphasized in his piece is think, how does a user use technology, right? Mm -hmm. And if you can't meet them to what they expect and what their day-to-day -day expectations are interacting with the platform, then it's just not going to work. So I think to me, that's the large takeaway. All right, guys, uh, that's going to do it for us today. Thanks for listening to the Hustle Daily Show. We're a proud part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. I'm Zachary Crockett, and big thanks to Robin Trung for joining me today. Thank you. Shout out to our producers, Darren Clark and Matt Brown. If you liked what you heard today, we've got a lot more interesting stuff over at thehustle.co. So go check us out and give us a shot. Hustle.co. Catch you all tomorrow.